When you analyze data, it's important to remember that numbers can mean different things in different contexts. And this can change how you analyze the data and how you interpret your results. That is, one on one variable may not equal one on another variable. For example, on one variable, one might be the number of children a person has. But on another variable, one might be temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, or one might mean first place in a race, or maybe one means that a respondent is currently employed. One of the important things that differentiates each of these examples is that they are all at different levels of measurement. The number itself, separately from the variable, brings along different kinds of information. There are several different theories for describing the differences between measurements and variables, but it might be simplest to simply think of these variables as being either categorical or quantitative. It's also possible to break each of these groups down a little more and talk about nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio level variables. We'll start by looking at categorical variables. As their name implies, these variables simply put people or observations into different categories or groups. Examples might include gender, where people can be categorized as male or female, and job rank, which might include many different levels. Categorical variables can also be broken down into nominal and ordinal variables. So that's what we'll look at next. Nominal means name. And in this case, the categories are just different. They're not ordered or measured. That is, even though you may give a number to someone on a nominal variable, it doesn't indicate an amount of something. Instead, it's just a stand-in for a word of, or name of a category. Because of this, any numbers assigned are ultimately arbitrary. That is, they can take any value you want. It doesn't really matter. But to be clear, you might want to code a value with a number because certain computer programs work much better that way, and it can make the analysis much easier to conduct and interpret. Some examples of nominal variables include things like state of residence, where you might give a 1 to people in Alabama because that's the first one alphabetically, or 1 to people in California because it's got the most people, or one to people in Utah, because that's where I live, and so on. Also, a person's social security number is a nominal variable, where the number is unique to each person and stands in as a substitute for their identity in certain records. This might make more sense with an example of arbitrary coding. We'll start by creating an empty table. And then we'll label the two columns as employed and not employed, because we may want to record that information for people in a study. And our first choice is to write the words yes and no to indicate whether a person is employed. But we could also use the abbreviations emp for employed and not for not employed. Similarly, we could use numbers such as one for employed and two for not employed because those might be the order that the options show up. Or we could use plus one for employed and minus one for not employed as a way of showing positive and negative outcomes. And this is related to something called effect coding that can be used in regression, although we won't cover that in this course. Or we could use a convention from computer programming and use a 1 to indicate that something is present or true, whereas a 0 would indicate that something is absent or false. Not surprisingly, this is called indicator coding, although you'll often see the term dummy coding for the same thing. In this case, a person who is employed gets a 1, a person who is not employed gets a 0. I actually prefer this method for a number of reasons, but hopefully what this table shows you is that you have many choices in how to code a categorical variable. The next kind of variable that we'll look at, also a categorical variable, is ordinal. Ordinal, of course, means order, like first, second, last. You may remember that these are called ordinal numbers as opposed to cardinal numbers, which are regular numbers like 1, 2, 3. A couple of examples of ordinal variables include things like Olympic medals, where gold goes to first place, silver to second place, bronze to third place, or maybe seniority rankings at a job, which for a college or university teacher can include lecturer, assistant professor, associate professor, and full professor, among others. I should mention that although there are special statistical procedures for ordinal variables, they're difficult to deal with. As such, ordinal variables are usually treated as categorical variables where different ranks are considered as unordered categories without doing too much damage to the data. The next general group of variables is quantitative variables, where the score indicates the quantity or amount of something that gets measured. Examples include temperature or funding raised, 
As with categorical variables, it's possible to break down quantitative variables into two smaller groups, interval variables and ratio variables. Interval variables are ones where the values indicate how far a person's score is above or below some point. In every case, the distance between scores is precise and the measurement units are all the same size. An interval variable may or may not include zero as a value, but if it does, that zero is relative and arbitrary. So an interval variable may not have a zero, as with IQ, where it's simply not possible to get a score of zero, or an interval variable may have a zero, but maybe you can go right past zero into the negative numbers, as with temperature in Fahrenheit or Celsius. Because of this, it isn't possible to say that one value is twice as much as another. For example, you can't say that 80 degrees Fahrenheit is twice as hot as 40 degrees Fahrenheit. It's exactly 40 degrees hotter, but it's not twice as hot. One situation where it's common to hear the word interval is in races, where the time for the leader or winner is given, and then intervals, or the time behind the leader, are given for all the competitors who follow. Another place where interval scales pop up a lot is rating scales, like 1 to 7 scales, where people rate their agreement with a statement. As a side note, a lot of people call the 1 to 7 rating scale, like strongly disagree to strongly agree, a Likert scale, after researcher Rensis Likert. But that label has more to do with the questions on the questionnaire than their response format. And while Likert and others worked very hard to create equal appearing intervals for their questionnaires, it's an enormous amount of effort. Technically, the scores on a 1 to 7 are ordinal, and a lot of people say you therefore can't do certain things with them, but every researcher I know kind of closes one eye and treats them as interval anyhow. Finally, a ratio variable, or a variable on the ratio level of measurement, is one where the values indicate a score's distance above an absolute zero. As with interval variables, the distance is precise and all the units are the same size. However, a ratio variable always has an absolute zero that indicates the complete lack of the thing being measured. That zero point, however, may be theoretical in that nobody actually gets that measurement the way that nobody can be zero inches tall, but it still serves as the starting point. However, any time you can say one score is, for example, twice as big as another, that is, any time you can form a ratio between two values, then you must have a ratio level variable. A few examples of ratio level variables include the time it takes a person to complete a task. This is because time always starts at zero and goes up from there. A person who takes four minutes to complete a task takes twice as long as somebody who takes two minutes to do the same task. In comes another example, because in most situations, money starts at zero and goes up. As with time, a person who makes $100,000 per year makes twice as much money as a person who makes $50,000 per year. And these kinds of comparisons only make sense when the variable is at a ratio level. I'll just mention one qualification about money. Money is a tricky issue because while it's true that 100000 is twice as much as 50000 it's also true that a person could be in debt and can have a negative income or net worth. Perhaps more importantly, though, the phenomenological or psychological experience of money isn't linear and has more to do with ordinal value and local social comparisons. So maybe dollars is ratio level, but worth is something else entirely. In fact, that gets us to our next topic. A variable is nearly always able to be measured, analyzed, or interpreted at more than one level of measurement. And you can move back and forth between levels as best suits your purposes. To look at money again, any of the four levels of measurement may apply. We usually think of income as a ratio level variable, so 100,000 is twice as much as 50,000. That's pretty easy. But it's also true that income can be treated as an interval level variable. For example, person A might make $5,000 more than person B. We don't know what the absolute values are, and so we can't form a ratio between the two, but we can say exactly how far apart they are. Similarly, income might be considered at the ordinal level where social comparison and self-rankings are more important than actual numbers. I believe that this is psychologically the most useful level for examining income. And finally, income can also be coded as a nominal variable, where a person is simply categorized, for example, as being either above or below the poverty line. Again, the point here is that a variable's level of measurement is not set in stone, but can be adapted to the most useful and informative level in a particular analysis. 
think about what your goals are and see how you can adapt your data to help you reach your goals. One additional distinction that can be important is the difference between continuous and discrete variables. I bring this up because these terms are frequently misused. Often, they're confused with the concepts of quantitative and categorical variables. This is a mistake because all continuous and discrete variables are quantitative and none are categorical. It's frustrating because these terms are often mislabeled and misused in computer programming languages and even some important statistical languages. I think it just creates confusion. What the terms refer to is whether a quantitative value can be measured to an arbitrary level of precision, or whether it comes in non-reducible chunks. A continuous quantitative variable can be measured to an infinite or arbitrary level of precision. That is, you can have as many decimal places as you want. Examples of this include time, which can be measured to seconds or tenths of seconds or thousandths of seconds and so on, as well as height or even emotional levels. Discrete quantitative variables, on the other hand, come in chunks that can't be reduced. Usually these chunks are in whole numbers or unit values, such as number of children in a family or games won and lost. There are, however, some discrete variables that come in non-unit chunks, such as innings pitched in baseball, which come in thirds, American shoe sizes, which come in halves, and American dress sizes, which usually come in multiples of two. However, the difference between continuous and discrete variables doesn't usually make a big difference. It can make certain charts like histograms and scatter plots look strange, and we'll discuss that later. But for most analyses, there's no noticeable effect. Let's finish this chapter by reviewing the information on levels of measurement one more time. We'll put the information into a table and list the levels on the left and their associated attributes on the right. At the bottom is the nominal level of measurement because it contains the least information. All it indicates is category or group membership. The next step up is the ordinal level of measurement, which keeps the information about categories but puts them in order by ranking them from least to most or most to least. Above that is the interval level of measurement, which keeps the categories and orders of the two levels below but adds distance. That is, it adds steps of fixed distance between each of the scores, which makes a lot of things possible. And finally, the highest level of measurement, the one that contains the most information, is the ratio level of measurement. It keeps the categories, order, and uniform distances of the other three levels, but adds a true zero point, which makes it possible to form ratios between scores. And so, that's the end of Chapter 1 of Data Sense, and the end of our introduction to the basic principles in terms of statistics. In Chapter 2, we'll put some of the concepts into action by looking at distributions of variables, which is one of the most basic and informative steps you can take in creating the story that you'll tell with your data.